Welcome to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt Podcast, the latest swine nutrition research digested for you. I'm your host, Clayton Chastain, and today we have with us Dr. Clint Edmonds, an assistant professor of biology at Clayton State University. So Dr. Edmonds, before we get started, would you mind giving the audience a short introduction about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, so like Clayton said, I am Clint Edmonds, um, and I have just started at Clayton State University within the last year, finished up my PhD at the University of Georgia uh, last May. Um, all of my research while I was there involved uh, swine nutrition, um, specifically the sector of mineral supplementation. Um, you know, minerals are quite the uh, finicky thing when it comes to swine nutrition. They're such a small part of the diet, but they have really big impacts when it comes to physiology as well as growth and performance in our pigs. Um, so, you know, that's really what I kind of did while I was at UGA. And I hope to kind of continue looking at some things uh, in regards to mineral supplementation in the future with some of my team from UGA, as well as uh, collaborating with people at Clayton State. Awesome. So let's talk about a little bit of the work that you did for your PhD while you were at the University of Georgia. So I saw some studies relating to uh, meganine supplementation, like you mentioned earlier with um, organic minerals and stuff. So would you mind telling us a bit about those studies? Oh, sure. Um, so one of the main studies that I had during my PhD was uh, the sow study that we essentially followed um, sows over the course of two parodies. Um, we supplemented levels at 0, 20, and 40 parts per million uh, manganese. So the NRC recommendation for sows is right at 25 uh, parts per million. Uh, that's for lactating and gestating sows. Um, and I will say uh, a lot of times with our basal diets, and for example, in this study, uh, when we actually analyze um, for the manganese levels, it was our control diet was at 42 parts per million. Now, that value uh, is very deceiving because a lot of times we don't actually know the full bioavailability of the 42 parts per million that's actually in the basal diet. So of course our ingredients, corn, soybean, all that uh, has manganese in it. But again, we don't really know how much of the sow is actually able to use. And so we supplemented on top of that, which is reflected in um, our analysis that we had. We had approximately 20 more um, parts per million on top of the 42 and then 40 more on top of the 42 for our 40 part per million diet. Um, and the reason we chose those two levels uh, really was just because it's, it's just under the NRC recommendation and then just above. Um, so we can kind of see if there's um, really any difference between what we would expect with the uh, normal NRC recommendation and then those altered levels. Um, and so with this study, like I said, we followed uh, these sows, a group of sows over uh, two parodies, um, took around close to a year. We actually finished up our data collection in March of 2020, uh, which was very, very convenient <laughs> um, because we then were not able to be in the labs for several, several months. Uh, but uh, we had some very interesting results. So some things to note, we did um, increase some lactation feed intake of these sows uh, while uh, we were doing this study, which was reflected, I believe, in the piglets uh, because they had also increased average daily gain. More. And I'm, I'm in talking about the controls compared to the 20 and 40 parts per million. Um, so we had some increased feed intake and as a result, increased um, piglet average daily gain as well as weaning weights in those pigs. Um, and I will say, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily the manganese specifically uh, that may have been causing those changes in the piglets themselves. It, it was likely the increased average daily gain and weaning weights were due to increased sow feed intake. Now I will say we looked at milk components as well. Um, and we noticed that there was a decrease uh, in the percent fat of our 20 and 40 part per million sows. And I think that that is another reason why we had some increase. We, we basically had increased milk production uh, and likely increased milk demand from those piglets from those sows, um, which is likely part of the reason why we had, again, the increased average daily gain in those piglets as well as weaning weights in those piglets. Um, now why manganese? I, I don't know if we really talked about why we even care about manganese. Uh, so from a physiological or biochemical point of view, manganese is very important for a number of things. Um, so it's definitely an important enzyme or a component of an enzyme, uh, that's responsible for synthesis of chondroitin sulfate, which is a important part of the organic matrix of bone. And so with bone development, you're starting to grow, the piglets are starting to grow. There's a big role um, early on 
and that and that's also true in sows as well. Uh, now, manganese also has roles in some antioxidant enzymes, uh, specifically manganese superoxide dismutase, and this is very relevant for our piglets once they reach the nursery at weaning, um, because of course they have increased cellular stress, oxidative stress, and so manganese sul- uh, superoxide dismutase, as well as uh, catalase and uh, glutathione peroxidase, are a few of the main antioxidant enzymes that kind of help to minimize the production of those reactive oxygen species. Now, as far as the roles in the sow, uh, there are, of course, all of these roles, the enzyme roles. Um, there's also some known um, relation to the synthesis or of manganese being involved in the synthesis of squalene, which is actually a precursor to cholesterol, which of course, cholesterol is a precursor for all of our uh, steroid hormones, so progesterone, and estrogen, et cetera. And so it's been shown in a lot of, uh, probably, I would say the fifties and sixties, a lot of research early on with manganese kind of showed that feeding sows, very minimal or deficient diets in manganese actually had impacts on, uh, piglets. Well, first of all, piglets even being born, but then also, um, having small, weak piglets. Um, so I think that was definitely kind of a pivotal point in understanding that, oh, manganese is definitely important that we need to be supplementing. Uh, to these sows because it can have it can have impacts like this, and so we did look at progesterone and um, not progesterone and prolactin uh, in our sows, and we actually didn't really notice any significant differences. Again, this could there could be any number of reasons why that was the case. Uh, it's possible they weren't on the diets for long enough for it to really have an impact at that deep of a level. Um, so there's no no true way to know why we didn't really see many differences there, but it was important to test for those things because we know that there is that involvement of manganese with um, squalene, ultimately cholesterol, and then progesterone and estrogen. Um, some other things that we looked at, we looked at manganese superoxide dismutase in tissues of piglets at weaning. Uh, we actually did, and we only did that during the second cycle. Um, and so what we looked at there or what we saw there was um, we had decreases in manganese sod activity uh, specifically in the liver there weren't we took it from the liver heart and the ileum Um, we had decreases in the liver sod levels and in an adjacent study we noticed that we did have decreases in activity um, when we had increasing levels of manganese and it's possible that a lot of that is due to having a more primed antioxidant system. And I would say that was probably more relevant for the South study, just because if you've got these piglets that have, you know, had manganese indirectly through the milk, um, while being in the fairing room and then getting to weaning, and then they had decreased SOD levels, it's possible that they were actually able to overcome um, those the stress or that there was less oxidative stress at weaning than our control. Um, so that was interesting to note uh, with that particular part of the study. Um, but those were really the highlights, I would say, of our sow study. So you mentioned that the increased average daily gain in weaning waste of the piglets may have just been due to the sow's increased lactation feed intake. Um, rather than any sort of like direct uh, manganese effect on the piglets themselves. Um, so I guess mechanistically, how do you think that increased the feed intake of the sows during lactation? Do you think it was more just like a hormonal response? Because you mentioned some hormones uh, earlier, or do you think there was something else involved? I mean, I think it could be a combination of hormonal things. We didn't necessarily look at those hormone concentrations once we got into the farrowing room like leading into parturition and then after that um i would say it is possible too that it was a palatability type thing Uh, maybe that's part of the reason why we had such increased intake in our 20 and 40 part per million sows um which you know palatability is important and so it's possible that that could have been the reason why but of course it's also possible that they were better able to utilize the mineral and then that improved um, milk production and colostrum production, all of that. So those those are some possibilities, I think, as far as how maybe that uh, the manganese actually increased that uh, lactation feed intake. Gotcha. 
And this uh, second question I had was, um, I read that this was done over um, a couple different cycles of piglets for these sows. Um, did you see any difference um, in terms of average daily gain of the piglets for manganese supplementation for like the first cycle versus the second cycle? Sure. Um, so we actually noticed, and this was kind of true in a couple different parameters that we looked at. Um, in our first cycle, we noted, I mean, we had a very, again, trend in the fact but control piglets they gained less per day they weighed less at weaning um then when we got to our 20 and 40 part per million sales we had slight increases um and i would say that the first cycle compared to the second cycle we did still see the trend of the control having the least um, but it was really noted in the 40 part per million that there was a slight decrease in average daily gain in the second cycle for the 40 part per million group compared to the first cycle um, and again, there's no, there's no real way to know exactly what that was attributed to. It's possible. So when we went from one cycle to the other, we did lose, uh, some sows in the sense of they dropped out of the study. They did, uh, they didn't go back and they weren't rebred. Um, and so we dropped those from the analysis. And so that's possible that that kind of shifted some of the numbers a little bit more than we would have liked, but of course we couldn't include them because it wouldn't have been very accurate to include any numbers that we didn't intend on being in the study. <laughs> gotcha. Well, I think that's all the time we have today. Um, so thanks a bunch for uh, coming on the show and sharing those studies with us. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Yep. And to everyone else, thank you for listening to the Swine Nutrition Black Belt podcast. Please visit us at swinenutritionblackbelt.com and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast channel so you won't miss out on the next episode. See you next week. Hey, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode and we are constantly on the lookout for the latest updates in swine nutrition. And if you have a swine nutrition related research trial that you would be able to share on our podcast, please send an email to nutritionblackbelt at swineit.com and we would love to talk about your research. See you later.